Beide, stopp, stopp, stopp. Well, he knows what he's doing. So that's like the most dumbest thing we've ever done to any discovery. <laughs> Fabian's discovery is broken again and it needs to go into our garage again. So that's now the second dumbest thing we've done today. Oh my God, that looks really bad. And it doesn't look that bad. It certainly doesn't look broken. Oh my God. So that's how a stripped engine block looks like. Pretty small actually. In this episode, we want to show you what's wrong with Fabian's Discovery 3 this time. We got it here and we want to go over our repair so far and what we're going to do down the road. Enjoy the video. Enjoy the video. So look who's back. I'm ultimately stressed. Stop, stop, I stand. Stop, stop, stop. Stop, stop. Langsam, stop, stop. Reicht nicht. Reicht nicht. Wieder. Jawohl. Okay, good. I think this is by far the longest vehicle what we ever had inside our driveway. But he's doing that for 18 years. So no problem. Is he down there? My Land Rover Discovery 3 It's never broken. I cannot believe this car is here again. Poor Fabian. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. That is just too much for me. <laughs> well, he knows what he's doing. So oh, he's, uh, he's a professional. He's that is so good. That, come on. In, in one take, did he get out? The tow truck actually touched our pillar. This is a 600 by 500 concrete pillar I made myself. No, you made it with me. Okay, and it's steel reinforced. Sticker. The sticker on the side of his tow trucks. So I used my magnet here and I moved it along each of those filter ribs. And there is clearly debris in here. So that's like the most dumbest thing we've ever done to any discovery. <laughs> but the rooftop tent and um, the roof rack have to come off. I got a brand new rope here. This is like <laughs> new. <laughs> and please do not comment. So this is the oil pan and you can see that there are a lot of metal parts. Oh, that looks really bad. I think the engine is completely busted. Christian has taken everything out and this is a crankshaft. And it doesn't look that bad. It certainly doesn't look broken. Oh my God. Oh, that's where the prop shaft is. 
Oh, already loose. So here you can see the oil pan. Yeah, you see. You know, big ones. And here's the oil pump from the inside. So we got Fabian's Discovery 3 here and he's got some minor problem with it. Vera, lift the top for us. Yeah, carefully. Yeah, thank you. There's a lot missing. Yeah. We decided before we take it and have it scrapped, <laughs> we'll try to take that engine out and see if we can fix it because he invested a lot of money into this car and it would pretty much bankrupt him. He would not be able to buy another SUV like this. He would have to drive around with a smart car or something. <laughs> so I thought we're gonna try to help him. And we took the engine out in our garage and in our driveway. With, I have footage for that, of that. Without body off. And let me tell you, this was the worst job possible. It is actually a Land Rover procedure to take the engine out and not body off like everyone does. The Land Rover Discovery 3 manual up to build year 2009 specifies how to take that engine out. It's right in the manual, but trust me, it is difficult. It took us about 12 hours. I think if we would do it again, it would take about six to seven hours. I cannot advise anyone to try to do it this route. If you can get a hoist, Put the car on the hoist and take the body off. You will have that body off with most likely very little damage in four hours versus us and we were three people. It was Fabian, me and Vera. It took us 12 hours because we got hung up on a couple of bolts and you start at 10 o'clock on a bolt and then you're done with at two o'clock. But the best way to avoid problems with this is not to drive a Discovery 3. That's the easiest advice I can give you. There are some cars out there with 330,000 kilometers and hopefully you are one of the lucky ones and you will never have an engine failure in this car. But Fabian did everything he could with his car, but the previous owner had the thing Land Rover maintained by the book and it got only very few oil changes. The guy was driving nearly 30,000 kilometers a year with it and then the oil was only changed so and so often. Our entire driveway. Yes, Christian. Here are parts. Everywhere are parts. There are more parts. Here's the bumper. Now that's what a an open discovery engine looks like. Scary, doesn't it look like scary? That's where the crankshaft is. Some screws are really, really long. So we had several single bolts where we needed more than two hours for one bolt. But let's see what Christian ordered this time. I'm assuming he wants to do a uh, a transmission flush on his Discovery 4, which is over there, a sharp knife in the other. That's never a good idea. Also something for the ZF, well, maybe a new filter or stuff like that. And guess what, what we have to do today? We have to put on the wheels and move that car out of the garage in order to get the remaining engine out. Christian organized um, like a little crane and it's raining, like I said. So we have to put up the tarp. Hoch. Hoch. That's a steering column. So where's the messing hammer? Grass hammer, that's what he needs. That made a big difference. How to wreck a discovery <laughs> completely. Oh, stop, stop, stop. It's still it's still completely hung up on the on the cable. Right, no, I can't see That's anything. Helpful. And it's raining. 
Don't let it drop. Wait. Oh, there's no, one there more. Goes with it. No, no, here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, now higher. Oh my god. You guys are stupid. So, what Fabian doesn't realize is that all we did now is we take it apart so we can sell it in pieces to the junkyard. Yeah. Because <laughs> there is no chance we're going to get this back in. The stupid crossover pipe is why this job is so difficult. <sighs> so, no. Yes. You got it? Yeah. I would not release it. But that's what it's made for. I mean, it's quality Chinese made. Yeah. Okay. No other country can make this stand so cheap. Okay, this one can go away. Voila. You see our nice motor crane we made? We, we, we welded this up here so that we can lift the motor without completely destroying it. Yeah, I think that cheap Chinese engine mount is gonna do that. Does not your welded construction. It does not look very promising, <laughs> does it? So what we got to do now is completely dismantle it. I See hope you know what you're doing, man. Engine's complaining it. I'm not paying attention. No, you're not paying attention. <laughs> you are no help. <laughs> So is this the wiring harness? Should be free now. Oh boy, we're so. never gonna get that back on. So there's the wiring harness. Now Sarah and Tuned, she would redo all that. Everything looks just fine. Yeah, everything looks perfect. Yeah. It's maybe I don't see any damage. On the first few, we're going to open the oil cooler area here and then we turn the engine around and take the crankshaft out. Oh, what are you doing? I'm removing the oil cooler and the diesel cooler. So removing this... <gasps> There's this, a paper! This is not inside the engine, Vera. This is just a, an, a spot to collect dirt. Yeah, but it's oily. Yeah, because that's from changing the oil, it, you lose every time a little bit of oil in there. You better not find any chips until I'm back. Oh, wow. That's, do you see that? That's really cool. <laughs> that's so great. What do you call it? A crane? You know, the cranes are flying over Germany right now, heading south. So Luna has to sit inside the car. Chips. Next dumb idea. We have to turn around. We have to turn around the engine. Is it schwer? No, it's not Oh, God. Oh, yeah. What? Look how much play it got. Yeah. It's broken here. That it sucks. So much play. We should have done the crankshaft first. No. We need to do oh, we need to flush everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at that. You shouldn't be able to take this out. See, this is the bearing shell. Yeah. And they started to turn. And they're not supposed to. No, they're not supposed to. Yeah. And what that means is the block is wasted. The engine block. Engine block is wasted. That thing? Yes. So 1500 euros. And now we're going to take this one out and it's also spun. See? You see it already on the... This is the second main. It's also spun. So what yes. is interesting now is that the first main is okay. The second and third spun around. The fourth one we don't know yet. That so. looks like another stupid idea. It's another stupid idea. Yeah, for from, sure. From Land Rover. Oh, I break it. Yeah, of course, I have to break it. Can I go inside for a little while? Yes. I have stuff to do.
stitches, first taking out the stretch on all eight in reverse order and then taking them out completely. They are so tight, it's unbelievable. Now I can take the cylinder head off really easy. And so before I take out the pistons, I'm gonna scrape off really carefully, really carefully the deposits right here, which didn't get reached by the piston rings. This way I'm not destroying the piston rings or getting the pistons stuck in this buildup. I don't wanna get over the buildup and scrape into the cylinder bore. Don't need a lot of force. And I do that on all of them. There we go. One, two, three. And I'm gonna make this piston number four. There is an arrow stamped into the pistons, which points towards the front. Now piston number four, taking out the squirters. There we go. The squirters squirt oil on the underside of the piston. That lubricates the upper connection rod bearing and it also cools down the piston combustion area. So this is a brass rotary brush with an RPM adjustable angle grinder. Again, brass. This is not attacking the surface whatsoever. It just gets the loose debris off and makes cleaning a lot easier. This engine block is ready for machining. Now that's how a stripped engine block looks like. Pretty small actually. I'm checking that at three positions, so come over here. So this is all the way at the top and you can see the indicator hits zero. I go into the center indicator hits zero so forth and I go all the way down and it hits zero as well so for an engine which got 190,000 kilometers I think he's got on it there's not even a measurable wear in the piston bore that tells you how good the worst engine on the planet really is. It's only the third worst engine. Yes, it's only the third worst engine. It's a <laughs> diesel really, engine, by the if, way. If this engine would not have those crankshaft issues and oil starvation things, it would be living forever. The reason why this engine failed is really visible on the other side, and it's like on any other TDV6 engine you find in the internet. You got the main crankshaft bearings right here, um, basically at four places. And you can see this place here is still perfect. And this place is perfect. But here you can see these wear marks. And they are because the bearings started to spin in the engine block. And if this happens, it's only minutes before you get a completely broken engine block, even a broken crankshaft. So, but because Fabian is so oversensitive to his engine, he actually stopped before the crankshaft snapped. We want to go through on, on with some advice what we did here. Let's take a look at the parts we took out. Okay, let's do that first. This is already well organized now I, here. I wanted to say because it was scattered all over here. Yeah. Up right now. Yeah, I see. Screw every screw by itself. It's gonna take all day. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder <laughs> so basically, um, I organized the parts in two categories. That is, parts we're gonna install after the engine is back in the vehicle, and parts we install on the engine before we put it into the vehicle. I try to organize it like this according to the Land Rover yes, manual. But we're going to install that one. That one is exactly <laughs> one you cannot install before the engine is really? back. Really? No, no, that's why it's here. Advice. Yes, it's a pain in the butt. I thought maybe but you made a mistake. No, no, it's not. I went through this line by line. So, for example, here you have the oil pickup tube and the lower oil pan which cannot go on 
before you put the engine into the car, just as well as the little intake I hose. I hope everybody knows what that is and yeah, what that's kind a, of a pain that is. That's a painful intake <laughs> hose. And then you see the usual plastic crap. So this is not really bad. Once the engine is in, this is not a terrible thing to put it back together. But now let's take a look over here again. The biggest problem when you take this engine out is actually everything above here. Above? Yeah, everything above here. So let No, me don't go you, in. Let me show you what the big problem oh on God. this engine is. And I, I'm not smart, okay? I learned all this from Altblech Schrauber. He did this. He's a smart one. And he's really smart about this engine. The problem with the engine when you want to take it out is this pipe. This is the crossover pipe and it is mounted there like this. And it is hiding some of the mounting bolts here behind it. So you basically have to take this pipe out and the mounting bolts for this pipe, including the brackets, are also in this area. And you need to access them from down there, out of this corner and out of this corner, reaching up here with your hand, working entirely blind. And in order to get to it, you have to disconnect the transmission cross member, lower the transmission down in the back. This kind of leans the engine this way. And that makes it even possible to reach up in here and get into your, with your hands to those bolts. And the biggest problem why you have to take this out, even if you would get some of these bolts out, is this cable here. This cable is running, not where I have it here, it is running there like this. This is the wiring harness from the transmission. If you would want to take the engine out like this, you would have that wiring harness on top of the engine now sitting and you would pull the engine up and you would break that harness. So so that's the problem. So when we put the engine back in, we're going to put this harness over here. We're going to put it behind it and fasten it here in a way and protect it in a way that it does not get burned. But it's definitely going to go behind the um, crossover pipe. These bolts on here going into the exhaust manifold and over here going on to the turbocharger on the other side. They are extremely corroded and they won't loosen and you will have to cut some of those off with a really tiny die grinder um, which you reach up in there and it just takes forever. And then others, um, you can't get the wrench on, you can't turn the wrench not even five degrees until you have the last bolt out here and until you have this crossover pipe out calculate about four to six hours just for this job you do have to take the drive shaft off in the front the front drive shaft the rear drive shaft can actually take stay in and another pain is to take the exhaust out because it's all corroded so you just take a saw saw and saw right through it on a straight section of pipe and later on put a pipe clamp around it so once you got the engine completely loose and everything disconnected and you got the steering rack here disconnected, the crossover pipe out, the exhaust taken off, um, it is possible to lift it out just like any other regular engine with a cherry picker. We also took the entire radiator out and the entire hose assembly this way when we raised it up. We did not run out of stroke with our small cherry picker. One more thing. Um, it is relatively easy to take the front differential and set this down and lower it down. That makes it possible to take the oil pan off. You don't even have to take the half axle shafts out. That's easy. You just take that, take the drive shaft out and you lower it down and that gets, gets you a lot of room mm -hmm. underneath, which we did. Then it's much easier to work on some of this stuff. But you don't have to do that. According to the Land Rover manual, the axle can stay in place. Okay. And then there are a lot of little heat shields and things which are in this area and you have to reach through these holes and take all those out. This is the same kind of repair um, what you do when you take your intake hoses out. It's a tiny one down there. The tiny one. So you have to do some of those things in order to get the engine out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the work on top is really easy. Just the coolant crossover pipe as usual and then you have to put an attachment in to lift the engine out so let me show you guys this follow me 
Oh, I don't have that. I'm actually not sure if this is the particle filter or, or the, the catalytic cat. converter. I think it's the catalytic converter. But anyhow, you can see that I just took a saucer and cut it off right here. And you can see that this much. bolt here. Yeah, which bolt? You can see this bolt has a cut right here where I had to cut in with my die grinder to cut the nut off and all this blind in order to get this to break loose. I'm gonna have to weld this and dress it all up <laughs> before we put it back in. And then the other component, come over here. The other component which makes this really difficult, of course, is everything around the turbocharger. Oh. The turbocharger stays on the engine. Everything is good, but you gotta get these bolts loose here. This is where the crossover pipe connects to. Each one of those is a battle because you can't get your wrench up in there. Mm. And look how look how easy this moves still here after 180,000 kilometers. We made an engine hoist and we designed that in such a way that the engine is nicely balanced inside the vehicle and not jerking to one side. That makes it a lot easier but you can see all these welds and bends that took its time, probably three hours to make this. This was worthwhile doing it because using chains and stuff, you end up bending the brackets on the engine. You may even, you may even snap some of the aluminum off. Second time around when we do this on Vera's car, it will be oh. really easy. All this stuff gets stripped when the engine is out. So that's actually really easy. There was no problem whatsoever getting, getting the cylinder heads off or that's where the camshaft sits. Getting the uh, oh, injectors one. out. Oh my god. Yeah. What about the injectors? Is he gonna have them uh, checked yeah, before gonna, we put them in back again? Gonna, if we if we do rebuild the engine entirely, we're gonna get the injectors checked out by At Bosch, Bosch to service. see if they're still good. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, here's pretty much the stuff, except for the that wheel. That was broken on our um, fire on our firebird. Yeah, that's interesting now. You're so stupid. This. <laughs> This, this was easy to take out too. Um, taking the engine out, rebuilding it and putting it back in without a single spare part. Just using new bolts and components which need to be replaced when you do that kind of work. So without a new crankshaft or without new bearing shells, you can already expect about 1500 euros. Just on components, you need to take this thing apart and put it back together. For example, you know, the cylinder head gaskets. They you are, need two of them. Of course. They are expensive. That's all these bolts you see here, yeah. all these bolts, the they are one. expensive. You have to, and you have to buy new ones? Yes, you need new head bolts. You need, you need new bolts for the line see, bore. Here you see where the, the oil ran yeah, hot. When, when you you got, this is where the engine ran hot, but I think so this, is, this is survivable. This can still be remachined. This is the rear seal including the crankshaft position sensor. We're gonna have to replace all of this, including the sensor. It's mm -hmm. too risky to put this back in because the rubber and plastic is all hardened. So if you wanna get the seal back off, you have to destroy that ring again. Using a screwdriver. So right here you have, I don't know, maybe 150, 180 euros. Right there, you need about 350 to 400 euros on gaskets. The upper oil pan gasket, the lower oil pan gasket. Yeah. You have the valve cover gaskets. They are expensive too. They're very sophisticated. Yeah. The EGR gaskets, yeah. exhaust gaskets, vacuum pump gasket, which you can most likely only get in the UK. You need all bolts in the exhaust and hot area of the engine. So everything having to do with the crossover pipe, the turbocharger. You have many small hose clamps. You need a new oil pump. And what happens if you got a dramatic engine failure is the oil pump actually sucks up the dirt through the strainer oh. into the pump and the pump will then quickly wear out. And anyway, I would not run this pump longer than 120,000 kilometers. This is only a $100 item if you buy a cheap one and a $200 item if you buy an expensive one. Because that is a reinforced oil pump. Yes, this my is discovery the... did not have that. So which? We... Yeah, let me show you the non-reinforced one. When we bought your discovery, and we were completely green back then. But I did find really quickly in the internet that 
something is going on with that oil pump and I ordered a new oil pump and Vera said, why are we fixing the car? It's not even broken. <laughs> but it was causing the first almost marriage crisis. <laughs> but here you can see this is her pump, what we replaced when we got her car. Yeah. And this is Fabian's pump from a 2009. So this is from a 2006. And here you can see it's missing this gusset. Yeah. There, there's this additional gusset. And this one is missing it. So if we would have ran back, then this oil pump, our engine would have died within the next 20, 30,000 kilometers. Anyway, there's no way to run this pump. Uh, yeah. This is a sure failure of the engine. Another thing what I intend to replace now is the oil cooler. I cleaned this engine really well. Yeah, so this you're thing, a great detailer. So this thing is sitting in here and you can see the oil pump which is sitting in here blows the oil in here. The oil comes back out of this pipe here, out of one of these, I don't know exactly which one. And then it goes into here. Ah, it's oily. And it, oh, kaka. <laughs> and it runs through the cooler. This oil is poisonous. Oh, it's poisonous. Yeah, it's poisonous. Let me clean up my mess here first. The yep. oil cooler is anyway a pretty poor item on this engine because it can develop cracks here and it starts to leak here on this gasket. So you got here another 170 euros for a new oil cooler. So the money adds up quickly without having redone the actual engine. The water pump we're going to replace. Why? Because it's only um, 34 euros for oh. a good SKF pump and when we buy this o-ring here separate We would have to get it from Land Rover and it's 12 euro You know when he when Fabian is then around when we put the engine together on every component He's gonna ask oh, we really put the old one back in. Can't we buy a new one? Oh, I wrote a long list for him oh. Right here. This is our shopping list what we have right now and we are at 2,637 euros here. I don't want anyone to read this yet because oh, okay. I'm going to post the final list from the repair with every link, with everything we bought, with everything we did and spent into the video description down the road when, when the car finished. is running. But I think with the line boring and the new crankshaft, the repair is going to be about 3,200 euros. And Fabian was thinking about should he get a new engine because there are plenty of engines in Germany for around 3,500 euros and then it's a lot less work and I told him why don't you just get one of those engines and he had a really good reason why he didn't want to do that he said he already had so much bad luck by buying used component or used or remanufactured components and because he has free access to some crazy dude repairing all this for him he wants to have his engine rebuilt because then he knows it's all new i sent him the ebay ads and he called the guys and he investigated this he was talking to all the people first of all how can there be three engines in ebay from the same manufacturer all of them having less than 100,000 kilometers out of a Discovery 3 2006. This is a complete lie. This guy is lying in his head because there is no Discovery 3 on the planet. A wrecked Discovery 3 where you could take the engine out and it has less than 100,000 kilometers. <laughs> this is true. a flat out lie. If we would buy one of those engines, we would not know what we have. That's why he wanted to have his engine rebuilt using his components and using my not I can't really say skills but because I've we'll, never done that before. We'll only do that if Seppel, you know the guy Christian knows, gives yeah. us his okay. The, the fuel pipes are over here. I actually do not intend to renew them because these are metal to metal um, connections. I do not understand why this connection should not be reused. Land Rover says all the fuel pipes need to be renewed if they are loosened and retightened. Somebody knows why. I think because they want to make a lot of money. Yeah, this is the fuel rail. There are uh, two of those. They say this needs to be renewed. Okay. Oh, renew it. We, I, we're not going to renew this. Oh this God. piece with the pipes is about 300 euros. So we're not going to do that. Then the injectors, 
up to 300 euros a piece. We're going to get them inspected and we're going to renew this little washer here in the front. And I think they are just fine again. They put them into a test stand at Bosch and then they look at the pattern what they spray. And they also look at the amount and the leakage and all of this. So we we're, we're fine with this. We may install new camshaft, um, a new camshaft chain here. I don't think we may. Okay. We will. I, it's on my list right now. Yeah. So there is this piece and there is actually a chain tensioner. Because I really don't want to have anything to do with that engine afterwards again. Yeah, but that's not, that's not so easy to guarantee this. This is a chain tensioner, okay? And this is actually the reason why all this stuff rattles in the morning. Is this tensioner has a little spring inside. And that spring is not there to tension the camshaft chain. This is only there so it has like some basic pressure. There's actually oil injected into this tensioner right here and this port and that pushes it apart and until this happens all that stuff rattles. The plastic wears out. The plastic is also brittle after some time from all of the heat cycles. So this thing is going to be new together with the timing chain just because it's available. It's also not terribly expensive. Here in this video, I want to cover my theory why Fabian's car actually failed, okay? There are different kind of failure modes. And I think the root cause why he got so much bad luck here after replacing his fuel pump twice was simply because his engine didn't start well anymore. With his new used fuel pump he bought, or it was a remanufactured with warranty, he had a lot of cranking cycles in the morning and when the engine was hot. It was instead of like this immediate start what you have on the TDV6, he needed to crank sometimes three, four, five, six seconds. And in some events, his car didn't start anymore and he had to crank really, really long in order to get going like 15 seconds and so on. And I think because of this happening over a prolonged period of time, his main bearings actually took a beating. Right here is, is one of the main bearings. Once the crankshaft starts hitting this during a startup cycle, if the oil pressure is not there, that's the dangerous part on an engine because these bearings do not contact the crankshaft in running condition. Um, every engine head knows that. It's building up actually an oil film under pressure and then the engine is floating in between the bearing and the oil film. This is why these bearings are not really hardened. They are out of some really weird material and high-tech composites out of lead and zinc and who knows what. I, I'm not an engine guy, okay? I'm an electrician. But it's a really high-tech product, one of those bearings. And the bearings are designed in such a way to take a certain hit when you start the engine. So they are designed for like 500,000 starting cycles. When you crank it and it doesn't have the full oil pressure, the, the crankshaft actually starts to rub and eventually it will rub through that bearing and then it may delaminate some of the coatings and this delamination by prolonged cranking or wrong oil or bad oil or contaminated oil or wrong bearing clearances or bad luck because of the dude who assembled it in the plant or whatever can void those bearings and then they will start to delaminate and chips will come off. These chips will collect and get into the oil pump. The first chip or debris gets in here and it will cause a chain reaction and then cause more debris and get stuck and then it gets the first rubbing marks and it eventually at one point these chips will either put so much force on the bearings that they start to turn in the engine block like clonk they start to turn suddenly from one second to another, clunk. And when that happens, your engine dies within minutes. Because through these bearings, these are the upper bearings. We got the engine block upside down. These are the upper bearings. There is a hole inside and this hole is where the oil is injected. And then the lower bearing doesn't have a hole. The lower bearing takes all the force from the piston when it comes down and hits on it. So the lower bearing is usually the one which takes a larger abuse. But when these bearings now turn in the engine block as a pair, 
Because of increased friction, they do this. And as soon as this happens, the oil hole closes up. And once this oil hole is closed up, there's no more oil getting to the crankshaft. And then you have about 10 more minutes to go before this thing runs hot. And if you don't feel that, if you're not sensitive at that moment where it gets hot, it will seize. And because the engine has so much torque, it will snap the crankshaft. This is not the entire root cause. There are also crankshafts which snapped without having a bearing failure. This is a different kind of a failure mode. That's, that can happen when there is a lot of harmonic noise inside the crankshaft or if the bearing clearance is too high that it can break and snap due to fatigue failures, maybe even because of casting failures or hardening problems during the manufacturing process. But this is a different failure mode. In the most cases, you have a bearing failure. So you have rubbing marks and spun bearings and then a snapped crankshaft. And if that happens, the crankshaft also snaps at various places. Okay. According to the guy from Piston Broke Garage, he said he saw, he's pretty sure he saw crankshafts snapping at various different places. And that makes sense because depending on what bearing locks up first, the forces are applied differently and then the crankshaft would snap. And this engine has 440 newton meters of torque. So when you are in a load cycle and you floor it and it's under high RPM, you don't necessarily realize when this happens because you may be going up a hill, you're running high RPM, it just spins, it clocks up the oil hole, it may go around a few times and then it seizes up completely and then your engine dies because of a crankshaft failure. It can go so quickly yeah. that you don't realize that. But if you are a sensitive driver like Fabian, you will send a WhatsApp message to me because there is a slight whistling noise in the engine, okay? So he actually realized that something is wrong with this engine long before this thing was completely wasted. But we did one major mistake after that. My advice, because he was out of state at this time, have the ADAC, that's the uh, emergency help club here in Germany, have them tow it to Land Rover and have Land Rover take a look at it. And that's what he did. He had it towed there for free. Land Rover took the vehicle in, he waited three days, and then he got the diagnosis for 330 euros. It said, engine defect, repair cost 20,000 euros. And I told him, Fabian, why don't you call him and ask for a detailed written report and for pictures. And be aware, they actually sent him this. They gave him the pictures and they did take the oil filter out and they found debris in the oil filter. So for 330 euros, they managed to get the battery disconnected, the oil cap removed, and they used the magnet to get the chips out of the oil filter. They also, I mean, we got to give them some credit. They also measured the battery voltage. They disconnected the battery. They put a liner over the steering wheel and over the seat. And, and here's the point, they drove the car into the shop and let it run. That because he stopped it right away, most of the damage was actually done in the workshop at Jaguar. I, I want to even say they refed it because the car was still starting and running. You can give me as many hate comments as you want. 330 euros for someone who is a customer there to take an oil filter cap off. <laughs> Before he went on his out-of-state trip, he came here and we looked over his car because it was going to be his first trip ever. <laughs> so we measured his oil pressure, okay? And his oil pressure was 100% identical to Vera's car oil pressure. We measured that one a few days before. It was that. even better. It was even a little better. Yeah, that's good. Bisschen halten. Good. Stop. So I told him this car is gonna live forever. 
you got a better oil pressure than Vera and she's got way more miles on it. So the oil pressure did not kill the car. I mean, a lot of engine heads watch this and for them it's all boring, but not for everyone. So here, when you have a crankshaft like this, you have here the main bearings and now you got to wonder how does the oil actually get into the connection rods. And this is done over cross holes. So if you look at this main bearing here, you have a cross hole drilling. So we said this is lubricated with oil pressure and you can see that there is oil actually then going into the crankshaft into a cross hole bore and this supplies the oil to this connection rod bearing. You will see here is the other end. See I can stick this through. This is yeah. the same hole. Yeah? yeah, It's just my oh, okay. pin is too short. So if you got now a bad oil supply to this bearing immediately after of course this connection rod is also going to die. The rule of thumb is if you have any kind of grooves inside a crankshaft which make your fingernail get hung up or you even if you can even feel it you need to get the crankshaft reworked. None of them suffered from a slipping bearing inside the connecting rod. I got here a thousand grit sandpaper and look when I go over this with the thousand grit sandpaper it cleans up perfectly. Mm. See this here supplies this one and this here supplies this one because of the cross holes. I explained this. See, this one gets supplied by this one, which is still fine. This hole goes over here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now there is one unique scenario now here, which I think makes it possible for me to do the boring of this engine myself. And that is that the front and rear mains are still in perfect condition. This might be the last pass. And we got here 65 years of experience, should be the final pass. But there will be a video how we line bore this engine and there will be a video how to reassemble the engine, at least all this stuff, even if this is pleasantly done in detail on YouTube. I think it will still make up an enjoyable video with about 25 oh my gods from there. <laughs> Then when we put this thing back in the car, I don't think there will be a video because it's just so much pain. Filming. So hopefully there is something you learned, even if you just learned to check back in on the next video. <laughs> Think about subscribing to our channel. And as always, if you're already subscribed, don't unsubscribe just because we said something mean about Toyotas or whatever. See you next Sunday. Look, we got, we got an audience. <laughs> they are always interested in what we do.